the London Bridge Sports Medicine Podcast. Medical news, health, fitness, with Dr. AJ Seth. Hi there. Welcome to LBSM's Ask the Expert series. We put the important questions to our experts to give you the latest tips in health and fitness. This week, we're talking about the anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL. Now, lots of you would have heard about this ligament and how it can be injured in sports such as football. Today, we chat with Ben, an ACL rehab physiotherapist, and break down the detail of how the injury happens, how you diagnose and treat it, and the hot topic of whether you need an operation to fix it. Hope you enjoy listening. Ben, how are you doing? Hi, AJ. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to having a chat. Ben, just give us a bit of background about yourself before we get started. My name is Ben Saldivar. Uh, I'm a physiotherapist. Um, I'm currently based down in Bristol, but I run uh, an online ACL rehab service called ACL Rehab Online. Um, and so my main kind of passion and, and view of that is to provide people with uh, a kind of a level of support and structure to their rehab so that they can get back to the things that they like doing. Um, so yeah, got into the ACL side of things through a love of sports and um, sports injuries. Um, and uh, the ACL side of things is has got lots of different uh, parts to it. So that's kind of how I got into it really. So you're providing all your rehab from an ACL point of view online? So we take people from uh, pre-surgery or pretty much immediately as, long, as soon as they've got a diagnosis, as soon as they've had an MRI, um, up through to the end stages of the transport. Let's just start with what the ACL actually is. The ACL or the anterior cruciate ligament as it stands for, um, it's, it's a ligament. So it sits within the knee, so in between your thigh bone and your shin bone. Um, and effectively it's a, a structure that attaches from the underside of the thigh bone, kind of in the, inside the knee joint, um, and uh, keeps the, uh, the shin effectively stable and attached. So what can happen if we don't have an ACL is the shin can effectively just move forward too much um, or become unstable, can give way. Um, and so the ACL's main role there is to stabilize that knee and prevent it from, from giving way effectively when you're doing normal day-to-day. -day. So it's important in normal day-to-day -day life as well as when you're playing sport. So it is important. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a key stabilizer of the knee. However, depending on how strong you are, the strength and stability of the muscles around the knee, then uh, some people, uh, quite a large percentage of people, can actually get away without having an ACL. Um, but yeah, overall, it does provide some function on a day-to-day -day basis. So we know what it is. It's, it's a ligament inside the knee and it stabilizes in different forms of movement. Um, how would it typically get injured? When it comes to ACL injuries, they can come from a variety of uh, incidences and most typically they're going to be some form of high speed movement. So this is most common in, in sports, um, most common in sports what we, that we would refer to as kind of level one sports. So that might be football, basketball, rugby, netball, high speed, change of direction type sports. Um, it can also happen um, with things like uh, gymnastics and you know jumping off of a horse or um, skiing as well as obviously a, is a big one um, so one of the main reasons why I think these these ACL injuries occur um, is a uncontrolled or uncoordinated movement at high speed and what can happen is we place our foot in a specific position um, and this position might be uh, something that we've done many times before but because of a few different factors um, the knee can fall into a certain uh, angle or awkward position that can put undue stress on the ACL um, and unfortunately that can result in, in rupturing of the, of the ligament. So all those level one sports you mentioned have an element of dynamic movement to them in terms of twisting, cutting, sprinting. So are we saying that every time you plant your foot down and are changing direction, that is a potential force that goes through the knee that can cause an ACL injury? Potentially, it could. But at the same time, an ACL injury, lots of athletes do that thousands and thousands of times every day and no injury occurs. And so the most important thing to remember if you're playing sport is that the body is resilient and the, it's not just the ACL that's stabilizing the knee. So 
as a physio, obviously we will, I work mostly with addressing the muscular strength around the knee, which is critical, super, super important. And most people playing at a good level of sport or even at a, an amateur level of sport will have enough muscle, muscle strength and muscle control to stabilize that knee and you should be able to play sport completely fine. However, there can be a number of risk factors that come into play. Um, and there's just like any injury, um, ACL injuries are, are multifactorial. So it may be uh, often what we look what, when we when we see ACL injuries, um, they can be um, in a slightly uncontrolled environment. So say you're playing sport, um, you, you're running at high speed. So usually there's got to be some kind of velocity involved. So some kind of high speed running. Um, you plant the foot in potentially a slightly awkward position because maybe an, an opposing player is coming at you and you weren't expecting them to be there. You can plant the foot in a slightly awkward position um, and then your body may move in a way that it maybe doesn't usually um, and therefore that can put undue stress onto the, the ligament. However, you can also have done that exact same movement many times before without an injury. So things, other things that could potentially be uh, playing a role would be, you know, how uh, are you generally at this time? Are you a bit run down? Are you a little bit um, fatigued at the time? You know, all of these various different things can run into it. Have you had a previous injury, which means maybe you're not loading that knee up in a normal way, so you're compensating, therefore changing the way that you move, and that could potentially put you at a little bit of risk. Um, and then other things alongside sleep recovery, you know, um, there's been some research looking into ACL injury showing that people who've had uh, some form of niggle or pain in the kind of days leading up to the injury, it's a little bit more common to have had that. So maybe you're moving differently as well. Um, and there's many, many different factors that, that can kind of influence it. That's a good way of categorizing them, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, direct versus non-direct contact. Um, I think that the non-direct contact ones are, so the non-contact ones are a bit more difficult to get your head around because there's just so many variables of why it might happen. Um, and you mentioned a few there, like fatigue. So if you're feeling tired and you're feeling uh, like you've, you've done, a, you know, you've played lots of football in the week and you've got that final game of the week, you thought, you know what, I want to go for my last five-a-side push of the week. Um, would you say you are at higher risk there or is it just too difficult to predict? It's, it's very difficult to predict. Um, and I would say that if even looking, looking kind of deeper into the research when they look at, you know, to get people in the labs and they look at the biomechanics of people Sp predicting an injury if this is going to happen at this specific time is, is very 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 difficult if not impossible and so um one thing with with uh, fatigue there's a couple of different things that come into play so i would probably say you're a little bit more likely to pick up an injury such as um such as a muscle strain because maybe from a loading perspective so we think about how often injuries occur uh it's a spike or a, a, a buildup of a load over a short period of time or even over a longer period of time that exceeds the ability of the body to cope with it so if you run down you played you haven't you know say there's you know lockdown or something like that's been happening or you're coming back after christmas and you're playing a sport or going back to something you haven't done for a while then a sudden spike in load may lead to an injury now when it comes to acls there's a bit of debate here and some people think, okay, yeah, well, actually, maybe is it the fact that the players are tired that this is, this is being caused? But when we look at the research, it seems that a lot of ACL injuries will occur in the earlier stages of the game. Um, and so we say, okay, why is this? And I think one of the key interesting things about fatigue is actually in order for an ACL injury to occur, there does have to be quite a lot of high speed. And so is it that when you're fatigued, you can't actually get up to that level of uh, velocity and speed that uh, you need to be able to kind of do an ACL injury so I wouldn't necessarily say you're you're, you're definitely at high risk I'd say there's a, there's a lot of different things that come into it and we can talk about you know preventative measures and things like that um, but at the end of the day you know if we do look at the overall incidence of ACL at the moment there's a huge amount of research going on into it and it's probably one of the most studied things within kind of the musculoskeletal um, sports medicine area but unfortunately injury rates aren't going down. In fact, they're kind of slightly going up. So, you know, we still have a lot to learn about it. We mentioned a few potential risk factors, therefore, let's call them that. So contact versus non-contact, fatigue, um, type, of, type of sport you're doing and whether you're getting that high speed velocity changes. What about 
the person playing the sport. So is there anything that may put you at higher risk, whether it's age, gender, you know, demographic? What about that point of view? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few different things that we can, um, how we can break these risk factors down. So our, how it's typically referred to would be modifiable risk factors or things that we can actually make a change on. So that might be something like muscle strength or uh, muscle power, stability, all of these different things that we can go into. And then we've got the non-modifiable areas. And this might be something like your sex or uh, age. Um, so, you know, there is, if we look at, um, if we look at gender and we see uh, there is a, a, about 1, 1.5, 1.7 increased risk of having an ACL injury um, if you're female. Um, and there has been some discussion around, is this something to do with hormones? Is this something to do with um, your, uh, what we call the Q angle? So women having uh, slightly wider hips, for example, may put them, uh, their knees in a slightly more risky position when they're doing change of direction maneuvers and things like that. Um, however, we can't necessarily make a huge, or there's no concrete evidence to say, we can do specific things to, uh, to, to alter this. So taking, for example, that, uh, that specific uh, example, uh, if you are a female that plays sport, one of the common things and things that's being talk, spoken about now with regards to injury risk is what's the difference between um, female athletes and male athletes as they're coming up through sport in kind of younger stages, through kind of youth development, that kind of stuff. Um, and what we'll often see is that actually uh, maybe this is more of a social issue in that uh, uh, girls are often not necessarily encouraged as much to spend as much time in the weight room. Um, they're maybe not quite as, uh, as, as comfortable due to the environment that they've been in growing up, um, building strength. So perhaps they're starting from a, a level where from a strength perspective, which as we know can be a really big injury risk reduction factor, um, that potentially because they haven't had as much experience as maybe the boys in terms of the rough and tumble of things when they were younger, that uh, they may be at a higher risk. So maybe we should be encouraging our girls more and more um, from a younger ages to get involved in these kind of uh, more physical activities and sports, which I think is definitely heading in the right direction. Um, but maybe that, again, is a, is a factor that comes into play as to why later on they don't quite have the same level of kind of physical uh, muscle strength development etc mm. and does that also reflect into the way they move so just in terms of like you mentioned the rough and tumble in terms of how you take a fall or how you take a contact um, is it because women or girls uh, as they're growing up playing sports don't have the same exposure to some degree that it's not just the strength element it's it's a movement pattern element as well absolutely yeah so Again, exposure to multiple sports, and this is why we tend to encourage uh, not early specialization in a specific, specific sport, not to just play football from you know, a really young age and not play anything else, but instead to you know, get involved with as many different sports as possible when you're younger. And maybe the opportunity hasn't been there in the past for, uh, in terms of the, the variation in sports available to them, whether that be at school or clubs. Even, even as young as, you know, in younger, um, you know, when, you're, when you're a kid, it may be that boys are more likely to go and roll around in the dirt outside, I suppose, um, which again, just gives you that feel and that coordination and that sense of, you know, understanding where your body is in space and the ability to react to different stimulus and different mm. in environmental factors. Um, and so again, that may translate to the sporting field, meaning you don't have that same level of coordination. And, and let's just talk about age then. So is there, a difference in your risk of getting an ACL injury depending on what age you are compared to like a 12 year old um, you know playing football for your local school as opposed to a veteran playing you know for the Sunday league yeah yeah so I think again generally speaking ACLs tend to happen in between kind of the ages of probably 14 15 and 30 um, and so that's we can see is an area where the the level of contact, the level of speed, the level of, level of competitiveness within sport increases. Um, and so, as you get past you know thirty into your forties, fifties, etc., most people wouldn't necessarily be uh, be competing in, in in level one sports. 
but we would maybe see more of a injury risk coming from kind of things like skiing or, or those kind of things. But yeah, so I'd say it, it, for, for me, it seems to coincide more with higher speed movements and sports and things like that, um, that you potentially play when you're kind of in that, uh, youngish kind of moving into adulthood stage. Say we're, you know, we are a gymnast, uh, or we're doing gymnastics in a local, local club or athletics. And we've tweaked our knee and we think, oh, you know what, I've injured my knee here. How do we know if we've had an ACL injury or not? What, what are the signs and symptoms of an ACL injury? What I tend to advise uh, my patients is if you're, uh, if you're completing some form of high-speed maneuver or something where you feel like the knee has given way, um, so if you have an instability episode, um, if this is uh, associated with, there's a few different things. So you could potentially have an ACL from any of these things, but if they're all together, then I would be saying, okay, we need to look into this. So have we had an instability episode? Has the knee given way underneath us during some form of movement? Um, and then have we heard a pop? So again, that has been associated quite highly with ACL injuries. Have we heard quite a large or loud pop when this instability episode has happened? Um, and then directly after this, um, are we able to, are we able to play on? So if you're competing in, in whatever sport it is are you able to carry on and just play on as as, as if nothing happened um or do you have to come off um and then if you're having to come off again that will be another suggestion that okay maybe this is something a bit more significant and then what's happening directly after that so the acl we've got a big blood supply to it so often after injury pretty quickly within that first 24 hours we're going to see a big amount of swelling on the knee we're probably going to see a little bit of loss of range of motion um, so you can't fully straighten or bend that knee potentially. Um, but yeah, the swelling is the big one um, alongside the instability and maybe that pop as well. Mm. And I guess it's worth saying that, you know, there's lots of other ligaments in and around the knee that can be injured from the mechanisms and everything we've described, twisting, turning, you know, fast movements. And if you do, you do feel a pop, I think that's a, that's a relatively surer sign that something has torn or been disrupted um, ligament wise within the knee so it doesn't have to be an ACL injury does it no absolutely and I think that's that's an important thing to to remember and and often as well if if anyone's listening who's had an ACL injury you know I'd say it's very common to have alongside that ACL injury potentially a meniscus injury or you could have a meniscus injury on its own um, or like you said you could have any other ligament or bone issue as well hmm. Okay, so we've been playing in our Sunday league. You know, we've we've had a uh, we've gone for a ball, we've gone for a header, we, and we've landed awkwardly, and we've felt that pop. And yeah. you know, we fell to the floor. The knee started to swell, um, and we think, you know what, I can't play on here, and it's difficult to walk. You think, oh, I listened to that podcast last week, and uh, I might be having an, an ACL injury. So, what 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 do I do now? This is when you go and see AJ. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, effectively what you want to do is uh, you want to be uh, assessed. So uh, you can go along to A and E initially if you're, you know, if it's a weekend game or something like that, and you've got got no other help, just to clear something like anything more serious, like a fracture or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, in in most cases, well, obviously depending on on case by case basis, you know, you won't see anything on on a x-ray if it's a ligament or uh, or meniscus something like that um it, you would have to uh, have a have an uh, in-person assessment so seeing someone like a sports medicine doctor or a, a special uh, specialist physio um to assess the knee and and have an they'll, they'll be able to do a few different tests um but realistically in terms of if you want to be 100 percent sure as to what has actually gone on then an MRI scan is what's going to give you uh, the, the kind of black and white images there. Of, okay, yeah, we can see here we've done either our ACL or our uh, MCL, which is another ligament in the knee or meniscus, and that can give us a really good picture then as to what we need to do moving forward. Hmm. And, and that's exactly right. So, so that we see a lot of these patients uh, in clinic, and what's interesting is by the time they get to us, they've had they've perhaps been to a and and had an X-ray, which, like you said, most of the time it can be normal, um, but it can show there's a bit of fluid in the knee. What's really interesting is the, the best time to assess the, 
uh, and a knee that's had an injury that may be an ACL is right at the time of injury. So when we're covering elite sport events or we're covering football events, for example, you know, you, you, we can normally see the doctors run on or the physios run on to assess the, the damage uh, of, of the knee. That's the best time to assess how wobbly the knee is because once the swelling starts, it gets very difficult because as people have had knee injuries and swelling know, it gets very stiff, it gets very swollen, you can't really do much with it anyway. So then you're moving into the realms of, like you say, getting an MRI scan. Uh, and there's no real optimum time to get an MRI scan. You can get it done at any time. Uh, so, so don't panic and say, oh, I, I need it does an emergency um, procedure in A&E. Um, it can be done at certain points later as well. So what are, I guess, what, what the listeners um, should know is what they need to do if they've got a swollen knee, what would be the immediate recovery steps from that point of view? Yeah, for sure. So if you have had this experience and the knee is really swollen and um, you know you, you can't really straighten it or bend it, often the swelling or the fluid in the knee kind of impacts the ability to move, maybe we'll talk through what we don't want to do um, and what we'll often see is that people whilst they have one of these injuries they'll go home they'll sit down and say i can't really do much i'm just going to sit here for the next week or so um and so what what happens there is maybe that swelling will come down after after a few weeks but what happens is the knee can often stiffen up so if we're not getting into it straight away within the first kind of few days, ideally, um, then we can see that we, we like we, we already mentioned, we can lose a bit of that range of motion into extension, the knee can get a bit stiff. Um, and also, if we think about your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your calf muscles, if you're not walking, if you're not using them as you normally would, quite quickly they will start to atrophy or they'll start to um, become smaller and you'll lose muscle strength. So. As it's important that we move away from this uh, view of injuries where it's really important to just completely bed rest uh, for several weeks. So if we're taking more of an active approach to this, um, first things first, like I just said, we need to get the swelling down. So how are we going to do that? Typically, we'd look at something like a compression garment or a compression um, a cryo cuff. So something in an ideal world, like a game ready, um, or you can get different ice packs and uh, compression ice packs from, from things, places like Amazon as well. Um, and so that would be a really effective way to reduce some of the swelling. Alongside that, we'd look at elevation. So can we pop the foot up nice and high on a, you know, a few cushions, things like that, while if you are resting, um, so that you're allowing some of that swelling to drain down and some of that fluid to drain out of the knee as well. And then how can we start uh, addressing maybe some of these newfound issues that we've got with the knee. So, okay, when, when, what do we need to get back to? So we need to get back to walking and things like that as soon as we can. So depending on obviously how your pain is and how you're feeling, uh, one of the most important things that we want to start with is can we get that knee straight again? Um, and so there's a various number of exercises that you can do to try and work on getting that knee straight. And once that knee's looking a little bit straighter, you can start building that quadricep muscle back up again um, and start working on the way that you're walking and the mechanics and coordination of how you walk. And that will in turn um, slowly get you back into normal day-to-day uh, -day activity. Um, and, you know, what I would recommend for anyone in this position is to seek out advice from, uh, from a, a physiotherapist um, to guide this so that you're not necessarily doing it on your own and you can have, um, you can, you can make the decisions that, you, that for you that are right at the right time um, because everyone is slightly different. Uh, and Ben, you've made some really, really good points there because when I see acute knees in clinic, uh, so uh, an acute injury that's happened and it's potentially an ACL, it could be meniscus, it could be even before you get the MRI, I'm having conversations with the patients about exactly the, the points you mentioned, getting the knees straight, making sure those muscles don't go to sleep and don't become inactive because muscle wasting actually occurs relatively quickly and within a you know even a few days or a week or two um, you can have quite good going atrophy of the muscles and then all we're doing is setting the rehab process starting further back so we have to regain our normal function first and then go on from there but actually handing over to someone like yourself and getting getting a good 
rehabilitation program right at the time of injury, even the few days after injury, probably are key moments, which I think most people have, um, you know, e- either ignored or don't don't really see as being a vital time of the rehab process. But I, I would say it's probably the most vital time where you can really keep those muscles engaged and making sure you keep them active and keep them strong. Uh, and that will bode um, really well later on down the rehab process as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll often see people come in several months down the line and, you know, they're maybe still limping. They still don't have that quite knee extension there. Often you'll see people, and if anyone's, you know, a few months down the line from ACL, they'll look at their quads uh, and they'll say, goodness, like my, my ACL injured quad is half the size of my other one and I've not even done anything. Um, and so that avoiding that is, is crucial um for the for the long term and then obviously when we're talking about surgery if we're going into surgery um if that's the option that we're going for with a really uh, wasted knee with with you know the quadricep nowhere near as where where we'd like it to be and coming out the other side we're going to lose even more of that and then it's going to be an uphill battle moving forward again sunday league player injured the knee got in contact with the clinic and yourself and have got a good initial rehab program can get the knee straight, the swelling's gone down. The next obvious question that always comes with ACL is, do you need to have it repaired? What are your thoughts on that? That is the million dollar question. Um, so I think it, like everything in, in this uh, field, it depends. So if we look um, at somebody, well, if we look at the overall instance of is non-surgical um, treatment an option or is it a good option? Uh, and I would say absolutely yes, it is. Um, we've got a lot of evidence now supporting that. Yes, like even we spoke at the beginning that the ACL is important. It's very much possible to build for a lot of people, um, not necessarily everyone, but for a lot of people to build up to a level of strength and control where actually you don't notice that you don't have an ACL and it feels completely fine in your day-to-day activities. Um, and so if we look at sports where you are or activities where you're more, a little bit more uh, straight line or linear. So things like if you're a runner and you want to just get back into running and that's what you love doing, uh, then I would say, yeah, absolutely. I would say the, the surgical process is a real tough commitment. Um, and it takes a long time. And it's a lot of hard work. If you're not particularly fussed about going back into high level sports, um, again, if you're maybe a little bit older, um, then I would say that the non-surgical option is, is, probably a better option than going for surgery. Um, And then when we look at maybe your more athletic population, so people who do, you know, I do want to get back to playing sport. The best paper that we have is from 2013, Frobel. Um, They took a group of young athletic um, level one sports, again, those football, basketball, et cetera, uh, netball uh, athletes. And they found that actually, uh, they took the, they split them into two groups. Some of them didn't have surgery. Some of them did have surgery. Um, the ones that didn't have surgery, if we look at them in two years and at five years, um, the outcomes were actually the same as the people who did have surgery. Um, so that was more with the thought process of, are these people getting back to sport? Now, a, a percentage of the group that didn't have surgery um, ended up, having to go and have surgery within maybe two or three months um, because that is the opens up the other conversation of okay if you try and have non-operative rehab or um, you know you you go without surgery then that's not going to work for everyone it should work for quite a a good amount of people but not for everyone so some people will try it and then their knee will still be giving way they'll still be getting um, maybe feelings that they're not confident on that knee from a, a stability perspective um, and therefore they will need to go and have surgery. But even those in that group that did delay the surgery from this paper at two years and at five years down the line, the level of function was the same regardless of what option you chose. It's so variable, isn't it? And, and I guess the other thing to say is it also depends on what type of injury you've had from an ACL. So if it's an ACL tear or partial tear, so you don't have to completely rupture this ligament, then sometimes you know it, it's best to to manage it through rehabilitation. If it's a complete rupture and there's another uh, structure that's been damaged or associated injury with the ACL, then you're thinking, you know what, we've got two unstable variables here. I think this probably needs uh, um, a more of an intervention to provide that stability uh, across the knee. So, so it is 
extremely variable, as you say. And again, with my patients, I always ask them, what do you want from your knee? Do you want to be playing um, five-a-side football three times a week? Do you want to go skiing three times a year? You know, what do you want from your knee? Um, and that's probably the most pertinent question, isn't it? In finding out what, you know, if whether it needs to be repaired. Because if your ambitions are to go for a, a walk around the park on the Sunday with the grandkids, then maybe not, you know? I just want to yeah. ask you about... Um, the surgical process and if you don't have it does that put your knee at any sort of risk going forward in years to come if you don't have the surgery if you don't um, have the surgery yeah so that has been something that has been been discussed i think in, in the past and and people have, have mentioned that yeah if you don't have the surgery is does that mean that your knee is moving around a bit more and therefore potentially is going to contribute to some more wear and tear um, however, more recent studies have actually showed that, uh, unfortunately, if you have an ACL injury, the likelihood of you getting an osteoarthritis of some kind, some kind of wear and tear, is quite high. Um, and that actually doesn't make any difference whether you have the surgery or if you don't. Um, and again, looking, again, obviously, there's, there may be papers going one way and the other. But again, if you don't have the surgery, are you then likely to get, are you at higher risk of getting a meniscus tear? Or are you going to have another incident where that knee gives way later down the line um, and you cause another injury? There is that risk there, but there is also that risk there if you have the surgery. Um, and again, another paper showing that from a meniscus perspective, there wasn't a difference between um, those that had surgery and those that hadn't had surgery with the incidence of meniscus repair, uh, tears, sorry, in the kind of coming years returning to sport. So I think I'm not necessarily someone that says to, to everyone, you know, non-surgery, you should give that 100% a go, and then surgery is kind of the second option. I think it's definitely a case-by-case -case basis. I think if you go for the non-surgical, can work for sure, but it's also a tougher, I find, mental battle in that people's it's, they don't know, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Is their knee going to be a bit unstable? Are they going to put six months of effort into non-surgical rehab? And then they go back and then the knee gives way and they're going to have to go and have the surgery. And people often struggle with that. They think, I've just put in all this work. However, what I tend to say to people is, look, put your, put your efforts into, the, and again, if you're in the UK and you're going through the NHS, then you may have, you know, six, nine, 12 months to, to wait for surgery anyway. So put as much effort into the, into the, the, the pre-surgery rehab or the non-surgical rehab. And what that means is even if you do have to go for surgery in the end, you're going to be in a better place because you won't have had all that muscle loss that we talked about before. You'll be stronger than you probably were even pre-injury. And therefore going into surgery, you've got a really good place to start from um, for the future. And most ACL surgeons will say the best predictive outcome factor for out, uh, a positive outcome from ACL surgery is the state and strength of the knee going into surgery. So that is, that is really key. And the other thing I'd say is when patients ask me, will an ACL uh, repair help the health of my knee going forward? The, the simple answer is it depends on what you do with your knee, right? So if you're keeping your knee strong, flexible, supple, good muscle bulk, then that's going to be the best outcome all round. If you're relying on an ACL graft to do that work for you, then I think you're setting yourself short a little bit. So the general principles of how to, you know, looking after your body, looking after your um, muscle conditioning is, is the key thing to get across, really. Definitely. And I often say to people, once you've had an ACL injury, if you, if you want to put yourself in the best position for you know, long-term knee health, this is a lifetime commitment of keeping up, not necessarily with structured physio, but you need to make sure that you're, you're maintaining your strength throughout the legs and your fitness and things like that, which, you know, ideally we should all be doing anyway. Hmm. Right. Let, lastly, let's just talk about the recovery process then. So what, what would a rehab process look like from someone who's done the acute management we suggested? So, you know, the knee is much better now. It's come, to, it's come down, the swelling's come down. Um, it can, you can straighten it fully. It doesn't feel too unstable. You can get about, do your day-to-day -day sort of activity. When can I go back to playing football is the, is the question that always gets asked. So what would an ideal 
rehab process look like or is there such a thing as an ideal rehab process yeah absolutely so it's quite helpful to start with the end in mind so if we're talking you want to get back to playing football what does a fully rehabilitated athlete look like what what do you want to you know can we nail our colors to the mask and say okay when you are at this level you can go back and we can we can look at that before you've even had surgery and we can say this is where you need to be in order to go back and that at least gives the patient some clarification on okay i'm not going to just be able to go back at six months nine months 12 months i need to fulfill this specific criteria of muscle strength and muscle power stability balance etc um, and if you can hit those markers then you can go back to play sport um, now then what we do, if we know where we want to be in the long term, we can reverse engineer that and we can say, okay, if we want to be here at nine months or at 12 months, then where do we need to be at six months and at three months? And so the big kind of overall picture is an ideal rehab in terms of how it's structured from a, from a physio patient perspective would be you've got clear understanding of what you need to look like and where you're at compared to that specific goal or those specific goals. And then your program and your rehab uh, exercises will be tailored to okay you're a little bit weak here compared to where you want where we want you to be so uh, we're going to be really working on that specific issue um and you know i often say to people as well that yes it is a uh, it's a it's a pretty can be devastating injury but at the same time it is also an opportunity and you can come back from this stronger fitter faster than you were before and I often say to people when you finish this process you will be stronger than you've ever been before. Um, for the most, for the majority of amateur athletes, at least that will be true. Um, and so an ideal kind of rehab, if we, if we kind of look more from the early stages, um, we're gonna start with, like we talked about, getting that knee nice and calm, get rid of the swelling, get it nice and straight, get you back walking normally, transition you back into the gym so we can start loading up muscles, making sure that you're really consistent with that. So again, it's realistically the the amount of consistency you can have over nine to 12 months of rehab um you're going to have better outcomes if you dip in and dip out and you do a few weeks here you have a few weeks off there it's going to be a lot slower you're going to get more frustrated um and it is going to take longer um so consistency is king making sure you've got a structured program building strength at a certain level once you hit a certain level of strength we'll get you back into impact work and jumping landing running and then later stages, once you again hit certain levels of strength and power, be progressing into more of your change of direction, your agility stuff, which again should be structured. So building up your confidence in certain movements uh, and then slowly at the appropriate time, building you back into training um, for probably, I usually recommend people to go back to, you know, training before playing games for a good two to three months um, to get the coordination back and that kind of understanding of the game. Uh, before you then go back into gameplay and that would be again really gradual 25% of your normal building up kind of 20% per week or something like that. Yeah and, and it takes a lot of discipline doesn't it to to hold yourself back and say oh my knee actually feels okay I might go for a run or I might do something when you haven't yet progressed to the next stage of rehab. So like you say it's it's a real life learning process where you 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 need to be disciplined controlled methodical um and that will suit some people more than others of course but you know the, the best results do come from a staged process that has been taken um very very carefully and cautiously not to over push things because the last thing you want to be doing is having a huge setback when you've put in lots of work um and lots of good effort for for many months um and the other thing i'd say is that, you know at, at the beginning of having an acl injury it might just seem like a life devastating event but actually if you break the rehab down into stages it's much more digestible it's much less intimidating and it, it feels very achievable you know um and it's so much easier doing it under someone like yourself who can guide a patient through that course rather than having this whole uh, you know looking at dr google or youtube videos and just having being overwhelmed by what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing, because it's so individualized, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the one of the big things when it comes to, to ACR rehab, especially if you're trying to get back to sport, is working with someone that has that understanding of the later stages. And 
And from a physiotherapy perspective, you know, a lot of physios are going to be excellent at those early stages and getting you back to walking and uh, back into the gym at kind of a, a decent level. But, you know, from a, a lot of uh, a lot of places as well, they may be missing that kind of uh, experience with regards to the later stage of strength and conditioning. So whether that be you go for a physiotherapist who has that experience in terms of strength and conditioning and reconditioning athletes, or you say, okay, I'm going to work with my physiotherapist up until a certain point, and then I'm going to move on to maybe a strength and conditioning coach who has that ability to take, you know, the real details of high level kind of athleticism and how to develop those. Um, Cause I think those are really important for your injury prevention as well in the long term. Yeah. And it can be as, it can be as detailed as you, as you want it to be because you can get quite into numbers and figures and objective data to perhaps suggest when you may be ready to go on to the next stage. And that might be testing power in the muscle, that might be testing your balance or your coordination. So there's a whole raft of tools uh, and little little tricks to help us guide you along um, the way you go. But like you say, it's the end, of sta- the end or later stages of rehab where you really um, make your money um, and make sure that you're optimizing yourself to put yourself in the best position, if not even a better position than when you were when you got injured. So yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely spot on and, and getting advice from a professional is always the best way to do that. Ben, thank you so much. That's been really, really informative and I, I'm sure the listeners have a lot to think about. Um, with not just ACLs, just any sort of knee injury. We, you know, you, you can follow the same principles as we've discussed um, for lots of different types of injury. But um, what would be your one golden tip for anyone who thinks that, or has an ACL injury? <sighs> one golden tip. Find someone that you can work with that will uh, give you some support throughout the whole process um, and uh, help keep you going because you need a good support team. Like going through it on your own is really, really tough. It can be a maze at times. So make sure you've got a good support team, surgeon, uh, doctor, physio, uh, family, all of those kind of things are, are, are super important to support you because it's a, it's a challenging time, but you can come back from it and you can get back to the things that you love. On that fantastically positive note, Ben, thank you so much. And we'll get you definitely back on the show again soon. Thanks, AJ. Great to chat. Thank you for listening to LBSM's Ask the Expert series. We really hope you enjoyed listening. If any of the topics discussed are relevant to you or you want to find out more, please get in touch by phone, email, social media, or visit our website. Thanks again and see you soon.